let's take a look at more applications of circular motion. And specifically, we'll look at circular motion in a vertical loop, artificial gravity, and two-dimensional circular motion with emphasis on the conical pendulum. But first, let's look at that circular motion in a vertical loop. So imagine you have a ball on the end of a string, and you swing it around in a vertical loop, like this, like this picture. Uh, if we think about the forces acting on the ball in four different places, well, in each situation, each point, we're going to have a tension force and a gravitational force. But they will be in oriented differently at each point in the circle. Sometimes they'll be in the same direction, sometimes they'll be in opposite direction, sometimes they're 90 degrees from each other. There's a lot going on here. Um, but what I want you to remember, the thing that's going to kind of ground us in all these problems, is that the centripetal force is always the force toward the center. So with that in mind, let's focus on two points in this path. So we're going to focus on the top of the path and the bottom of that vertical path. So at the top, we can draw this. There's the ball, there's the string. The tension force is toward the center. It's in the direction of the string. And the weight is also toward the center. It's downward toward the center of the Earth. So we can write an equation to relate these two magnitudes. The centripetal force, right, that's the force toward the center. The centripetal force is equal to the tension force plus the weight. Those two forces added together, they're both going towards the center. So the centripetal force, the force towards the center, is the sum of those two. Now remember, here I'm only talking about magnitudes. I'm ignoring direction. At the bottom of the path, we have it different. Here's the ball at the end of the string. The tension force is in the direction of the string is pulling, and the weight is downward. So in this situation, the centripetal force, the amount of force toward the center, is the tension force minus the weight. So those equations give us the relationship between centripetal force, tension force, and weight at the top and at the bottom. Now, if you've ever done this, you know that there's a minimum speed for the ball to make it over the top, right? If you swing it too slowly, the ball just won't make it to the top. So let's think about what that minimum speed would be there at the top. Well, if we're thinking about the minimum speed, we're kind of thinking about the smallest value of v. And the centripetal force, we can write that as m times v squared over r. So small speed in this situation means small centripetal force. The left-hand side of the equation is going to be small. And the way to make that small, well, if you look at the right-hand side, the right-hand side also has to be the small. The only thing on the right side that can change is the tension force. The weight is fixed. The only way you can change weight is by changing mass or g. You can't change g, and we're going to keep the same mass. So the only way that we can make the right-hand side of the equation small is by making ft small. And the smallest that ft, the tension force, can be is 0. So our condition for the minimum speed to make it over the top of this loop is when the centripetal force is equal to the gravitational force, when mv squared over r is equal to the gravitational force. Now let's look at a different example. Let's look at a roller coaster with a loop. So I'm going to draw the situation here. And let's say we have the car starting at rest at the top of the 50 meter hill. It goes down through the loop, and the loop has a radius of 15 meters. It's going to be a frictionless track, and we're going to ignore air resistance. Um, and we're also going to say that there's a 70 kilometer passenger in the car. Now I'm going to ask, what's the normal force on the passenger at the top of the loop? And I'm going to ask, does the passenger feel heavier or lighter than normal at the top of the loop? So what we're going to do is first we're going to use energy to find the speed of the car and the person at the top of the loop. We can do that with energy conservation. So the energy at the beginning, at the top of the hill, is equal to the energy at the end, at the top of the loop. So at the beginning, we have gravitational potential energy, mgh, and that's going to equal 1 half mv squared, because it has kinetic energy at the top of the loop, and mgh, because it has some potential energy at the top of the loop. So let's see, we can cancel out the mass, and then we have g times h, put in the numbers, that equals 1 half v squared plus g times the other h. Okay, uh, we can check to make sure that the units are all working out. All right, okay, go through the math. And we end up that at the top of the loop, it has a speed of 19.8 meters per second. Okay, what are we going to do with that? Well, at the top of the loop, we know that the centripetal force is equal to the normal force plus the weight. If we look at the forces at the top of the loop, there's a normal force downward, 
and there's a gravitational force downward, and those are both pointing towards the center. So the centripetal force is the sum of those two things. So we have mv squared over r, the centripetal force, is equal to the normal force plus mg. The normal force, remember, that's what we're solving for. Uh, so let's see, we got 70 kilograms times v squared over r, and that equals normal force plus 70 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. And notice, this equation right here is all about the magnitudes. It's only relating the magnitudes of centripetal force, normal force, and weight. So we don't put a negative in with G. because We're just talking about magnitudes, no corrections. All right. Now if we keep going through it, solve for the normal force. The normal force is equal to 1670 newtons. But remember, we're only talking about magnitudes in this equation, so we have to add in our own direction. And the normal force here is downward, if you look at our picture. So the normal force is 1670 newtons downward. All right. So remember, the normal force is related to how heavy you feel. So to answer that second question, well, usually, if we're just standing normally, uh, the normal force balances the weight. So we usually feel as heavy as the normal force in this situation. So in this situation, the normal force balances the weight. The weight is 686 newtons. So in a normal, everyday situation, this 70-kilogram person would feel... 686 newtons of normal force. But in this situation, at the top of the loop, the person feels 1,670 newtons. That's almost 2.4 times what they usually feel. So they will feel much heavier than usual at the top of the loop because the normal force is bigger. So building off of that idea, let's look at artificial gravity. So imagine you have a situation where you're out in space. Uh, there's no gravitational force acting on you, but you still want to feel heavy. You don't want to feel weightless. Well, one way that you can do that is by building a big cylindrical space station. And if we draw that, let's make the space station rotate, give it a radius r, and there's a person standing on the inside of it. Well, that person, if they're rotating around, there has to be a centripetal force acting on the person. And in this case, the centripetal force is the normal force from the inner edge of that cylinder. Well, if the person feels a normal force, there you go. The person feels like they are heavy even though there's no gravitational force acting on them. So let's look at an example. Let's say that we want to do this situation. We want to build a cylindrical space station, and we want a person to feel half as heavy as they would on Earth. And the space station is going to have a radius of 50 meters. I want to know, what's the period? OK, so there's our setup. So if we want to feel half as heavy as we do on Earth, well, on Earth, we feel as heavy as the weight, because the weight is normally balanced by the normal force. Usually the normal force is equal to the weight. But in this situation, we want the normal force to equal half of the weight on Earth. So weight on Earth is equal to m times g, where m is the mass of a person. So we get that. And the normal force here is the centripetal force. And the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over r. So now we have that relationship. And if you look, masses cancel out. Well, v squared over r is equal to 4 pi squared r over t squared. So we get this relationship. And now we can put in r and g. And if we do that, now we can solve for t squared. And t has to equal 20.1 seconds, meaning that that spaceship must rotate once every 20.1 seconds. Well, last, we're going to look at two examples of circular motion in two dimensions. One's going to be the conical pendulum. And I'll draw the situation here. So imagine we have a ball on the end of a string, and it's rotating around in a circle here. And when it does that, this string traces out the edge of a cone. Well, it's called a conical pendulum. So the ball at the end of the string is tracing around a circle, following a circular path. We'll name that R right there. And the length of string here makes an angle theta with a vertical line. And we'll give it a mass m. So in this situation, it's kind of unclear what the centripetal force is, right? The centripetal force is whatever force is toward the center, but like there's no single force toward the center. There's a weight downward, and there's a tension force along the string. But neither of those point toward the center. So what's happening here is that only part of the tension force is the centripetal force. Only part. Only one component of the tension force is the centripetal force. So if we look at this in the vertical, the weight is balanced by the y component of the tension force. 
And here I'm just talking about magnitudes. And then in the horizontal, the centripetal force is the force toward the center. And it's in the horizontal, right? So the centripetal force is the x component of the tension force. So those two equations will always be true for a conical pendulum. Everything after that is kind of situation dependent. So if we have the angle, let's say it's 30 degrees right there, and we know the mass of the pendulum is half a kilogram and the radius of the circle is 0 0.250 meters, let's say we want to know the tension force in V. So in this specific cir circumstance, we can use the components of the triangle, uh, the components of the tension force to go further. So the weight is equal to FTY. FTY is FT cosine theta. The weight is equal to mg. All right, now we can plug in the numbers. And if we plug in the numbers, we can solve for the tension force. It's equal to 5.66 newtons. And then over here, the centripetal force is equal to the x component of the tension force. So centripetal force is equal to FT sine theta in this situation. Centripetal force is equal to what m times the centripetal acceleration. Okay, And then that's equal to mv squared over r. And we know m, we know r, we know the tension force now, we know the angle. So we can solve for v, 1.19 meters per second. Now another situation that's two-dimensional and centripetal motion related is a banked curve. I'm going to draw a picture of this, but we're not going to do a numerical problem. But the picture would look like this. Uh, a banked curve is the kind of curve you would see in like a NASCAR track or a Formula One track. You also see this in highway exit ramps. Um, I used to have... Hot Wheels tracks like this when I was a kid. Um, also in Mario Kart, if you play Mario Kart, some of the tracks look like this. But essentially you've got a car going on an, a tilted surface as it goes around a circle. It's kind of hard to draw. Um, but I'll do my best. <laughs> so in this situation, we have a weight downward and we have a normal force this way. Um, now there also could be a friction force and that's what can complicate things. But we're going to ignore, we're going to assume there's no friction force. Uh, in this situation. So the centripetal force is the part of the normal force that's going toward the center, right? Because centripetal force is whatever force is toward the center, which here is the x component of the normal force. And then the weight is balanced by the y component of the normal force. It's pretty similar to the conical pendulum. But also keep in mind, if we were to add friction here, the situation would become a little bit more complicated and we have to do a little bit more work.